Sydney, thanks so much for joining me today. It's really my pleasure. Cool. Well, I really wanted to talk to you for so long for different reasons. First of all, you were on my all-time favorite show, Beverly Hills 90210. You've had this lifelong career in television. You live in Wilmington and you own a local business here. There's <laughs> yeah. so much to dive into. And here's maybe the craziest part. Your mom and I have the same name. You know, you do, and you spell it the same way, which, which is, is so, so unusual. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, think that's I noticed the that right away. This part out of all of this. Um, let's start at the beginning. Your dad was a famous musician, and you entered the entertainment industry at such a young age. How did that come about? Well, yes, both of my parents were musical entertainers. My dad, Hank Penny, was one of the pioneers of Western swing music. He uh, was quite a bit older than my mom. They were 19 years apart in age. And my dad was actually 53 when I was born. So his career started in the 30s. And he came out from Alabama. Sorry, my, my, my dog is being very affectionate right now. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom, right? Oh, okay, sit. Be a good boy. Thank you. He's being a good boy. That's awesome. Um, so he came out from Alabama to the West Coast to um, pursue a career in music. And he did uh, everything from films to television, early television, um, and recorded on DECA for many years in Capitol. And then um, in the 60s was based in, um, in Nevada and met my mother who was an operatically trained singer. And the funny thing is my dad was also a comedian and my mom you'd have to explain jokes to. <laughs> so the two of them couldn't have been like more different, you know, <laughs> but they worked together and then eventually fell in love and got married. And so I grew up watching them perform on stage. And when I was about three, three and a half or so, my sister Patty was watching me at this club that, where my parents were performing, very family friendly club. That's what they always did. And uh, they went on a coffee break. And somehow I slipped away from Patty and I went up on stage and took the microphone. I couldn't even imagine doing this now. I'm nowhere near this precocious or confident yes. as I must've been at three. And the audience was laughing. So my dad came back out and I wouldn't let my mom on stage, but dad and I did this little thing. I made up a song and we did a couple of jokes and I made up a stage name. I called myself Caroline which I think is really interesting now that I live in North Carolina. I don't know if there was something about <laughs> that. <to> me, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, so that's really how I started. That was my first foray into wow. entertainment. And I, I did a couple little things on stage with them growing up, but they were not, they were not about pushing me into the limelight, but it was kind of like, you know, it's the family business. If they had been plumbers, I could probably fix your sink. But yeah. Um, yeah, as it turned out, it was well, going to be in the entertainment world somewhere. <laughs> you entered the world of daytime soaps in the early 1990s. What yes. led you to that genre? I just had no awareness of soaps at all. Wow. Not even a tiny bit. <laughs> I didn't watch them. I knew the names of some of them and I saw them on the magazines in the supermarket, yeah. but that was it. Um, Paul Rausch was the executive producer of Santa Barbara. And Santa Barbara was a very special show. It was so different. It was so funny and glamorous and tongue in cheek and really quite an awesome show. Um, and Paul just wanted to have me on the show in some role or another. And so the one he ended up bringing me into was to play the character BJ Walker, who came on the show as Troy, we called Troy the boy. Because BJ had had some um, some issues uh, with her godfather, it was an, an incest storyline, which was perfectly heavy and very nicely handled, actually. But she wanted to mask her sexuality, and so mm -hmm. decided to be a boy for this period of time. So for the entire first month of the show, or whatever, my name wasn't listed on the credits, so they couldn't figure out who Troy was. Although you might have been able to tell because. I didn't look that much like a boy 
but I kind of did. You know, I had the wig, they yeah. padded up my, my, my shirt and everything. It was yeah. very interesting. I had classes to kind of study the difference between how you carry yourself, how you talk. It was a fascinating, fascinating experience. But um, yeah, and then after that, it's, it seems to be what happens to everybody that enters into the world of soaps. You go from one show to the next, yeah. to the next, to the next, and you're like, we need you for six weeks here. Can you come and replace this character for a while? And how about three years here? And how about three years there? So yeah, I ended up on, I don't even know how many, five? Maybe? Well, quite a few. So I feel yeah. like this is an impossible question. It's almost like when somebody asks you to choose your favorite child and it's like, how do yeah. you- Well, fortunately, I only have one child. I know so you that's do. An easy question. <laughs> but this is going to be harder between- okay. All My Children, Santa Barbara, Sunset Beach, The Bold and the Beautiful, which means the most to you when you look back today? Well, you know, I will say that it is, they each have a very special spot for me. And I'll tell you why with each of them. Mm -hmm. Santa Barbara was um, the first show that I did and the show where I met my husband because he was working as a production coordinator. Um, and it was just an amazing several months. It was about 10 months and the whole show culminated in my character's wedding. So it was pretty, you know, pretty special for that, but it was a very short little thing. And then, um, then all my children has been in my life over so many decades mm -hmm. and two really distinctly different periods. And that, that first period of time, particularly when we had the whole Noah and Julia storyline, it's, you know, it's really incomparable what we experienced and the fan response and the incredibly difficult work. So you're working five days a week with 30 pages of dialogue. On Friday, you're looking back and you're like, I just memorized 150 pages over this week. Yeah. That's why I'm so tired. <laughs> so, you know, you had two and a half, three years of that. And many actors have done that literally for 20 years. Nice. So yeah. I, I mean, it, it was, it was, that's why I like the genre for me. I'm, 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 I'm never going to say like, it's my wheelhouse mm -hmm. because I, uh, I, I couldn't have been one of those people that went on that way for decades. I just, just couldn't, you know? I always prefer like working outside, preferably with horses, maybe a Western, sci-fi, you know, like soaps are not my genre, but I just somehow got really successful in that world. But, your genre. So I would say between Santa Barbara and, and all my children, they have very different significances for me. And Bold and the Beautiful was seriously a lot of fun though because I've never worked with a group of people that were more excited to go out to lunch together and hang out together and go to all the parties that were associated with the show. It was just, it was kind of mind boggling what a glamorous world they traveled wow. in. <laughs> it wasn't really my world, but, but they let me have a little glimpse into it. Well, what was it like when you then took on a primetime show with Hyperion Bay? Well, it was very similar because it was more or less a nighttime soap and it felt more familiar to me because it was on film, then oh. film, actually 16 millimeter that still existed. Uh, and it was shot over, a, you know, like a seven day period. And um, that was more what I came from. Mm -hmm. um, but it was exciting because it was the first time I'd been part of a show that really had kind of the network and studio aspect to it that was airing. And unfortunately we were up against Ally McBeal and Monday Night Football. So no one will ever know what that show could have been because we might have well been a tampon commercial for you know the ratings that were being drawn away from us. But it was it was a, a really neat cast. We uh, we we would always hang out together. So we had like a game night probably about once every couple of weeks, and we'd go to somebody's house and <laughs> and we'd play like you know Scrabble or yeah. Pictionary or whatever. We we really enjoyed we enjoyed each other a lot. I have a, a lot of good memories from that time. I was just gonna say that that's. It's wonderful that that's your take on it because a lot of people yeah. might be bitter or resentful or just remember the <laughs> break of a cancellation. Yeah, well, and it was funny too because how I learned about the cancellation, one of our PAs, like a production assistant, mm -hmm. called me and um, 
asked me if I could bring back my, my parking pass. <laughs> and I was like, you, what? You need my parking pass? He was like, yeah, we got the ax, we're canceled. And I was like this 18 year old like PA telling me that the show is canceled. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll bring back the parking pass. That's fine. So, so that's kind of how I found out there. <laughs> I've, had, I've had worse heartbreaks with shows that were canceled because it, you know, what would we do 18 episodes on that one or something? It wasn't like we'd put in a ton of, a ton of time and we kind of knew that the studio was splitting their uh, time and interest with us and other shows that were doing doing better out of the box. Yeah. Well, so that's fine. But um, yeah, when I did when I did Largo Winch later, which is a show that aired all mm -hmm. over the world, but not in the US. Nope. Um, <laughs> that one, that was actually like, like, that was a gut punch because I so loved working on that show. And yeah, so. I did, I did feel that at that time, that's for sure. Well, in 2000, you did four episodes of Beverly Hills Now to Now about through the show's final season. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, actually, while I was on All My Children in the kind of the mid 90s, mm -hmm. there were always these roles that came up and they kept trying to figure out how they could kind of get me into one of one of these characters and, and for a short arc but we could never make the schedule work it just never worked never you worked. remember who else you auditioned for which character no i i never auditioned it was always okay. something that was kind of just this would suit her so yeah. you know um and so i never really knew i never knew what it was all i knew was yeah. i wasn't available so it was <laughs> sort of like we got something for you you can't have it we got something for you you can't have it so then finally you know i was i was uh i was free i had time and this this arc came up with josie right yes josie, josie. that's wow. right and one of my favorite names too like one of my favorite character names well over the course of those four episodes your character is very wild she parties she does cocaine she folks oh like dylan and it all okay. culminates in one of the show's very few action slash thriller sequences. Totally. I want to know what you remember about shooting the hostage scenes where <laughs> your brother are holding Dylan and Noah hostage, and then it culminates with the van exploding. <laughs> to top it off, Brian Austin Green is directing that episode. Yes, he is. And, and my favorite memory, because, okay, look, let's get this straight. I don't do cocaine. I never have. I hate drugs. Just yeah, so you record know. straight. So that was like, they would hand me props and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, I know it eventually is supposed to go in your nose, but that, this is literally all and I have no clue. So that, you know, helped me through that. It was, um, And then also my character smoked and I, I do not smoke. Mm -hmm. Like I, and yeah. um, Brian, but Brian Austin Green does or did and a lot, like really a lot. And so, you know, I kind of watch, and I played a character before who had to smoke, but then it was a long time and I forgot. And, you know, camera magic, whatever. Yeah. So there was this scene where there was a gas station, if I remember correctly, yeah. or there was some kind of, there was, there was oil and gas around. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, there was a big explosion and all this. Yes. And it started off with my cigarette somehow this that caused this conflagration i need right. to go back and watch these i really do <laughs> i haven't seen them in like forever 20 years or something yeah so i needed to light a cigarette you know what the hell i'm doing so i'm holding on to the cigarette while i'm trying to light something like this and i guess it looked really stupid because you don't need to actually hold a cigarette while it's in your mouth which makes sense so Brian, Brian came up to me, he goes, you don't smoke, do you? And I was like, no, no, I don't. He's like, I kind of can tell. <laughs> so he had to like talk me through the whole thing of like how you light a cigarette, you know, how, to make it look kind of cool, which I'm sure I did not succeed in making it look cool at all. Cause you I know, don't know, you're dark, you're seeing pretty hand, I guess, I don't know. But so that was really, um, that was a, a definitely a memory and um oh my gosh just that warehouse we were downtown LA 
Mm-hmm. Um, my husband just walked in. And it was in a very, very weird part of town. They always find the weirdest locations for things mm-hmm. like that. Location managers are like, they just said it's in a warehouse and things are going <laughs> to blow up. Let's find the weirdest place to send them. So they did. Yeah. Um, but you no, know, it was great because each of those episodes were directed by a different star of the show. Ian Deering did another one of yours. Ian did, and I've seen him a couple of times since then. Um, I just loved all of them. Each each of the the folks that I that I got to work with ha- were so available and so warm and so um, so fun. And it was a very you could tell that it was like they were all in their living room. This was where they had lived forever, and I felt very welcomed into that. Mm-hmm. And Luke Perry, in yeah. particular, was um, so extraordinary and dear, and uh, not entirely over, not entirely over his passing. I got chills just now when you said his. Name. Yeah, I know, and he was um, he was so neat because he 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 took the he he kind of was having an aside with the with the director of photography, and he he kind of looks at me and he goes, you know, with her with her. It's all right here. It's all right there. And I just thought that was the nicest compliment from him or from anybody. You know, I was very, very touched by that. And you also worked with uh, Vincent Young a lot. And yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Vanessa, of course, is a big soap actress as well. Yeah. Um, God, it was fun. You know, so much of what happens um, for an actor on set are the, the funny conversations you have in the makeup trailer, you know, the things that are going, and what, what I didn't know was how there were multiple sets going on because they were shooting, they yeah. were constantly sh- shooting two sets at the same time, which yeah. makes so much sense. It was brilliant. They were a well-oiled machine. So don't waste your day just shooting one show. And shoot their, two or three. <laughs> their output, the volume, at their yeah. peak, they did 32 episodes for four seasons. It's amazing. It's amazing Considering what we get today. <laughs> I know, and I was so impressed by it. But it was it was a little it was a little daunting, even coming from having worked on soaps, um, because they just just threw it down. They could literally just like without rehearsing, they could stride into the peach pit and just start talking. Like they were just you know it was just all happening. Yeah, <laughs> and that was was very impressive because, like I said, it was you know that was their daily for a long time. One thing that I think is weird is that the actor who played Shane, your character's brother, was Jesse Hoffman. Mm-hmm. Nothing else after that. He like so that happens. Maybe it was me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if my only credit in my entire career was nine hundred two and zero, I'd be pretty proud of that. He had. I, I would think so. Absolutely. But nothing you've ever heard of. Yeah. Um. Beyond Beverly Hills and Until Now, you have so many interesting teen drama connections. And I have a long list here. And I do. Yeah, you do. So oh, wow. Okay. So first off, you you worked on one of Aaron Spelling's other shows, Sunset Beach, with his son Randy. Yes. Yes, I did. That's right. And I was there for a short period of time. Yes, because um, you were filling in for Susan Ward. I was, yeah, and that that was interesting. I, I was like, oh, I don't know how people are gonna take this because we're not the same in any way. We're both more or less brunettes, you know? Yes. I guess you could say that, yeah. but it was so lovely. It was really a neat period of time. And they, again, they were so embracing, but I have to tell you a really funny story about Sunset mm-hmm. Beach. Yeah. So they filmed, <laughs> they filmed on the same stage as Santa Barbara. Okay. Uh, of course, Santa Barbara had been canceled many years before. So then Sunset Beach came in. And I had stood on that stage when the word came down from the network about Santa Barbara that we weren't being picked up anymore. We were being picked up like six months at a time. And then finally it was like, we're done. Thank you. Thanks for playing. Bye bye. So, one, gosh, it must have been like the third day I was on Sunset Beach I'm in the makeup room. And everybody's like, really, <sighs> I could tell like they're all nervous. and. And somebody says, yeah, we have a meeting at lunch because um, the network wants to come down and talk to us. And, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, 
and I and I was like, oh, well, you know, like I'm not, you know, our ratings have been, I'm not so sure. I was like, look, this show is good. Mm -hmm. You guys are doing really good work. Look at all the stuff you have coming up. You know, you have this, you have that, and and your fans are great. I just read this article, and I think you guys are good. I don't think you have anything to worry about because I've been in your seat before, and um, and it's this is different. I think you guys are good. Literally standing in the same spot I stood years before to hear. Yeah. We just really want to thank you guys for all the hard work you did, but we're not going to be renewing your show. And I was like, I cannot be here for two announcements for two soaps <laughs> on the same stage. <laughs> no, in the soap world, it was one of the shortest lived soaps, but the Bob yeah. did hundreds and hundreds of episodes, which is crazy. Sure. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, they were very prolific and, and, and doing uh, all the shooting that they did actually on the beach. Mm -hmm. That was kind of fun. That was really fun. It was a, it was a neat show. I think think it was like Santa Barbara in that it was lighter and more romantic mm -hmm. and tongue in cheek. And you know, I I always wonder where some of the shows would have gone if they had gone on longer. You know, yeah. but that was a that was a that was a really nice one. I enjoyed the cast, and it was it was a short period of time, like six or eight weeks or something. But it was really mm -hmm. fun. Well, with, oh my Hyperion, God, my <laughs> with Hyperion Bay, you worked with Dylan, mm -hmm. who yeah. had shot Dawson's Creek in Wilmington. Yeah. And those shows had a producer in common. Dawson's Creek and Hyperion Bay were both produced by Jeffrey Stepakoff. Sure. Yes. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And then you appeared in and produced the movie Heart of the Country with Jenna Crane, mm -hmm. who was yeah. on One Tree Hill. And <laughs> Both of those productions also shot in Wilmington. Yes, true. And you also did a movie with Barry Corbin from One Tree Hill, and he was in The Thornbirds with you too. He was also in, um, um, why can't I remember what it's called? Barry and I have worked together four times. Thornbirds. I only got two. Yeah, I know. Uh, we did Thornbirds together and we did, uh, shoot, um, Rob, what was that called? Yeah, Heart, Hidden Places, Hidden Places, where he played a mean old sheriff. Yes, that's the one I, I know. Yeah, you got Hidden Places, that's right. And then we did another movie called Mountaintop, which was really funny because he played this guy that was on the stand being accused of something. I played a judge and I love it that they gave me this role to play a judge that was written for like a 60 year old man. <laughs> We're talking about fishing and tomatoes and they never rewrote it. They didn't rewrite it in the slightest bit to fit you know, me whatsoever. So here's Barry and Corbin and I'm like, well, what do you think of a catfish? <laughs> gonna jump today, <laughs> it was so funny. And then, um, Oh, what was the fourth one we did? Oh, there was something else. There had to be another one. I love Barry. Yeah. I, I, he and I, he's just, he's been this little, little thread that's woven through my whole life and we have so much fun together. He's so dear. And then the last show is Pretty Little Liars, which you did two episodes of and there's a million teen drama connections. <laughs> yeah, you probably <laughs> couldn't even list those. Or Layden and so many and yeah. It, I like to call these things teen drama worlds colliding, like someone from, I don't know, works with someone from Dawson's Creek who worked with someone from Winter Hill. It's just weird. Yeah. And then Wilmington, of course, has had two huge teen dramas film here and a ton of movies. So how did you end up coming to Wilmington? Well, you have to understand Wilmington is a, a vortex. <laughs> You're now swirled up in it. This is it. You're never getting out. Um, it, anybody who gets called here for some cosmic reason uh, has to keep coming back. Yep. And some of us end up living here. It's just what happens. You can't escape it. And um, I don't know what that is, but anybody that you talk to will tell you the same thing. So I came here to do a movie in 97, very tiny little budget independent feature mm -hmm. that was then called um, Go West and was later released as Enchanted. Okay. Um, and 
it, it was it was such a, a, a rush thing. I didn't know where Wilmington was. I had no clue, never heard of it, didn't have any idea. But uh, the lead actress had fallen out. I liked the script. I was asked to come to do this movie. And then all of a sudden here I was, literally that was Wednesday to Saturday. I'm on set, I'm shooting the next day. And so I spent a month here and um, my, my husband Rob came to visit and he had a little bit more time to go around and see everything. Mm -hmm. Although we were filming all over town. So I got a little glimpse and we were like, this place is kind of awesome. And I'm not gonna, don't, don't tell people this. This place is awful, it's awful, don't come here. <laughs> um, but then years later when, um, when I was going back to all my children, we, we didn't wanna be bi-coastal. So we sold our house out in California and thought, you know, maybe we get a little place in Wilmington, mm -hmm. you know, place to escape to. And then when my contract ended there, we were like, we're, we're here, we're staying here. This is, this is a good place. <laughs> Our son was like a year old. Mm -hmm. And, and this is a really, it's, it's been a perfect spot for us. So cool. And there's been nice film work here. It's been up and down depending on the tax credit situation and whatever else. Yeah. But um, this is where the crew wants to live and work. They'll go to Atlanta. They'll go to Savannah. They'll go to Raleigh. They'll go to Charlotte, but they want to be here. <laughs> Yeah. Well, tell me about your restaurant. Yeah, we own a Jester's Cafe. It's a breakfast and lunch and brunch spot that's um, kind of in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a place that we went to uh, before we purchased it and, and had a wonderful relationship with the owner who became a dear friend of ours, actually threw me a baby shower. <laughs> and um, when he was looking to, to move on and do something different, we thought, you know, that seems like it could be a natural for us because Rob went to the Cordon Bleu and studied cooking and he's oh, wow. a wonderful, wonderful chef. And I, you know, I can entertain people fairly well. So I probably <laughs> work out the, you know, the front of the house stuff. Right. And uh, it, it's been a challenging few years um, between hurricanes and pandemics. It's yeah. been very interesting. Um, learned a lot. Really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, so that's <laughs> so. There's that. <laughs> Last fall, you wrote a really compelling guest column for the Greater Wilmington Business. Journal. Oh wow! Yeah, thank you. How the pandemic affected your business? So, tell me about that, and how are things now? Well, things are quite, quite, uh, quite nice now. Um, we are. So we went back to work the minute we were allowed. So we were serving people again in May. Okay. Um, you know, they put out all kinds of protocols about how you had to seat people and how you had to roll silverware and oh, just everything you can think of. I had a, like a seven page sheet of how you run a restaurant in mm -hmm. pandemic. So we, we did that and, and we had perfect success, uh, all of our staff. And as far as we know, everyone who visited us was comfortable, happy and safe. And um, so we were able to keep our, the bulk of our staff employed, everybody who wanted to come back to work and uh, kind of just eked along, frankly, <laughs> because it was, you know, there, we were at 25% capacity is all we were allowed to do. And then as people became more comfortable, it, it, it ebbed and flowed. You know, yeah. and we had to seat mostly people outside. So when it turned cold again, nobody wants to sit outside. But we'd kind of invigorated our our takeout and delivery, so mm -hmm. it, it allowed us to it caused us to innovate a little bit. So mm -hmm. that was an interesting experience. But this spring, uh, right around Mother's Day, I guess it was when finally here um, yes. people could get back to um, to somewhat normal life. Uh, it, it exploded. It just wow. exploded to the point where um, I have waited tables a lot <laughs> because there was just not enough, not enough yeah. people to handle what was happening Volume, coming through yeah. the door. And so I like to joke that I'm the only actor that's ever never waited tables before I owned a restaurant, which is totally true. <laughs> <laughs> but I really you enjoy you it. wait the tables, then become exactly. the actor and get the game. Exactly. So you never, you never miss a rung on the ladder. You never miss a rung on the ladder. Mm -hmm. I had to do it much later, but I really liked it. 
it's super fun. <laughs> and I'm probably not the best waitress, but I'm telling you, I'll know their grandkids name by the time, you know, lunch yeah. is over. Yeah. So that's, we have fun. That's meaningful, especially in <laughs> a smallish town like we have where. Yes, exactly. Well, what is life like for you now professionally with acting? I believe you shot an indie film or two here in Wilmington at some point. There were a few names I recognized on the cast list. And I think you wrote one. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. I always say that I never work where I live and it doesn't matter where I live. If I live in Los Angeles, I work in New York. If I live in Wilmington, I work in Ottawa. You know, it's just how it is. So I, I never correlate the two of like where I live and where I work. Um, but what I've loved about being here is that the film community is really tight knit um, and very supportive of each other and each other's projects. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, about 12 years ago, I was asked to do uh, a little presentation project for, for a thing that called Birdies. That these guys were trying to put together total mm -hmm. funny comedy in the vein of like Caddyshack, let's say. And I met so many neat people in doing that when I first arrived here. We had so much fun. And so this spring, they called me up and they're like, hey we can do a, a full length feature now and we want you to be a part of it. And I was so touched. I was so, I really so touched that they still wanted me to be a part of yeah. it and that they were all still together and they all still wanted to do this. And it was it's so funny because it's, it's true. It's so raunchy in a lot of ways, but like my character is the, sort of the one, the straight man, like the, the good and pure character in the whole, <laughs> the whole story. But, um, I was just so happy to be a part of it, to see something that totally was grassroots and just grew into this. And I don't know where they're gonna end up with it. They may just show it in my living room right here, but you know, that's good, <laughs> we, had, we had fun. And then another little thing that I'm working on now and I'm gonna get to finish in about two weeks is um, a short film that I wrote called The Dishwasher mm -hmm. based on our actual former dishwasher who I, <laughs> He, you know, it's just really interesting how you realize that there are certain people who are so essential to a, to an, an operation, an operation, but that no one notices or really, really appreciates to, to the degree that, and, and then I thought about that and I was like, well, so what if that person in the cloak of, of that anonymity mm -hmm. was able to sort of pull some strings and make other people's lives better? Like, what if that's what he did? And so that's what this, uh, this short film is about. And I'm doing it with the Cape Fear Community College. Mm -hmm. I'm on their film advisory board. And um, we kind of worked this out to use it as a project for students to get real life experience on set and work with other film professionals. So we got one day shot in March of last year. And now we are shooting two more days, 15 <laughs> months later. <laughs> so, and I know one of those projects, I think you worked with Colin Moss on and he was on- like, Yeah, that's it, both of them. Well, yeah. he was in the first birdies and now he is uh, he is one of the stars of Dishwasher as well as his wife, Madison. Madison, Moss. yeah. Yes. And uh, for Caswell Hyman, who is a wonderful uh, actor, does a lot of uh, theater here locally and was in um, children's television as a writer and director. Just, a, he's a gift. He's so perfect for the lead character. And Jack Landry also who runs the Cape Fear Community College um, acting department and is a tremendous actor is playing another role. So um, I'm super lucky and I'm just so excited to finish it. <laughs> As you go about your life here in Wilmington, do you get recognized or do you think you blend in? I don't know. <laughs> okay. No, I don't know because like, for instance, I go to Costco all the time, right? But uh, we've gone there since it opened. I know by name, everyone who works there. So I'm like, hey, Julia, hey, Pam, like, hey, yeah. Denise. Like, I know, we know everybody. So I don't call that being recognized. They're like, they're my friends. Yeah. Um, and I think that Wilmington kind of has this thing that people who live here generally know, You're gonna you know, who's, who's in the town of, of some kind of note or repute. So they kind of yeah. leave you alone. But every now it'll be one of these things like, I guess you are. <laughs> but no, Wilmington's cool. Wilmington's cool that way. 
Okay, last question. Your son, does he have the acting bug at all? Is he going to follow you guys? He's a bit of a ham, but I don't know. You know, I think that we've been very um, uh, hands off. I mean, like, we, there's no particular goal for him. I, I don't know. It's He's an amazing student. So being that academically gifted, I, I, I don't know. He could sort of do anything. Yeah. He loves math and science. God bless him. Not me. He can do it and I don't have to. Nope. Um, but he really loves comedy and he loves to to be in front of people. Oh. And he's done some acting, but like on a proper scale for his age and you know, yeah. theater and that type of thing. I don't know. I have no idea. No idea. Sounds like it's in his genes, but he's got some other genes. Yeah, he does. It's 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 amazing. He kind of has. He's very well rounded. I'm happy for him that way. Well, if he be, ends up becoming, you know, the third generation of the Penny lineage to make it in Hollywood, be sure to let me know. I certainly will. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. I'm thank so you, Sherry. I'm that. so glad we finally connected. Yeah. Yeah, and awesome. you know, we haven't even spoken about Larry Mullen, who's the one that know. put us in touch a few years ago. He's, he, and he's really the one responsible for getting me on to 90210. Okay. How do I know? I know Larry. Oh, I know Larry. I know Larry Longer. I know Barry Corbin um, <laughs> by about a year, maybe. So he uh, wrote uh, and produced a television pilot Mm -hmm. called the circle family okay. and it was this big cast of a family that lived in a motel that were um kind of circus people as i recall and they had an orangutan and a donkey and a whole crazy thing <laughs> and i was the girl of the family yeah. so that's how larry and i first met and then he was a producer on um and a writer on the new gidget Mm -hmm. so we did that for a couple of years yeah and then uh he was doing 90210 for quite a while producing that and that's kind of the period of time where they kept finding yeah. roles for me but I couldn't do them so I think by the time I finally got on 90210 he wasn't associated with it nope, anymore he so wasn't we kind of <laughs> crossed Just that line in the night and, yeah that's right and then Larry was also um on Largo with me mm. and uh we've we've been friends forever he was actually there not the day of but like the day after um or the week after or so right around 9 11 we were filming in france mm. and one of the memories that i have of like just getting through that week was um just playing we, we he had a, a couple of gloves and a ball and we we just played we played catch and we've uh We've been we've been close for a long time. He's a lovely person. He's always spoken so highly of you. And as soon as he learned that I was moving here years ago, he wanted me to look you up. And so yeah. I think we need to get him to come down here for a weekend, go to dinner. I know. Yeah, absolutely. You need to come on down to the restaurant. I will. I will. Come this weekend. I'm waiting tables. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, Sydney, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> thank you. I'll see you soon, I hope. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> Let's see.